So the topic that I have selected is intraocular TB simplified. So I think the question, which uh, I'm sure it's a teaching hospital and we have students joining us. So the basic question that arises is, how would TB present in the type? Now there are two kinds of phenotypes. One is known phenotypes of tuberculosis. That is, if you see, you think of TB, and then you have certain atypical phenotypes which means when you look into the eye, it does not look like TB, but then you do the test, the tests are positive, you really do not know whether it is TB or TB is incidental and some of those confusing circumstances. Now let's go over them one by one. What are the known phenotypes? The known phenotypes which all of us have been taught for ages is you have granulomatous interior uveitis, you have these mutton fat keratic precipitates, and you have these nodules on the surface of the iris called Fusaka nodule. So whenever we see this kind of interior uveitis, TB needs to be ruled out. The second one which we described long time is we all know Sineke and these are the filiform Sineke. But if you are seeing broad-based Sineke, that is a triangular form of Sineke which have a broad base, this indeed is one of the very specific signs that what we are dealing with could be tuberculosis. Coming from anterior to intermediate uveitis, intermediate honestly does not have very classical signs, but in my practical experience and what we published also is, if you see large snowballs and they do not form snow banking, like in pars planitis, so if they're just, you can see these large balls which are floating around in the inferior vitreous, it's important to rule out TB. Again, just to repeat, these are chronic, large snowballs, and by and large, you do not see typical snow banking in tuberculosis. Coming to retinal vasculitis, the very typical vasculitis in tuberculosis is segmented. It involves the vein, so it is periphlebitis, you may have disc edema or sometimes even neuroretinitis and the hallmark of the disease is occlusive. So it is occlusive kind of vasculitis which is the hallmark for tubercular vasculitis. Very importantly, if you're looking at this eye or even the opposite eye in a patient with vasculitis and you encounter these patches of choroiditis, which are perivascular. You can see them, they are along the veins. So this is one sign, which is very, very classical for TB. So heel directive perivenular scars, occlusive vasculitis, and you are seeing retinal new vascularization either in VT R and the E, which occurs typically at the junction of the profused and non-profused retina. Think about TB. Then choroidal tubercles, which we are all very familiar with. These are uh, these small little tubercles, which can be one eight to one disc diameter in size, and you may have the large tubercles. So these are the ones which may be a manifestation of millinery tuberculosis and not always the latent disease. So this is the typical description, grayish white to yellow, indistinct border. They are mostly located in the posterior pole, but they can be anywhere varying from one four to several disc diameters in size. And if you see these tubercles, you always rule out for active pulmonary disease. Then sometimes you have a very large tuberculoma, as you can see in this patient, bilateral tuberculoma. 
So one clinical clue that I'm going to give you is if you see the hemorrhage, the blood vessel dipping and vascularity on granuloma, think of TB as a pos possible etiology because TB granulomas are VEGF driven and they do show these signs of new vascularization. Some of important, one of the important phenotypes which we had the privilege of describing for the first time is serpiginous like choroditis. So the serpiginous like choroditis that we see in TB is kind of very different from autoimmune variety in the way it tends to be unilateral. It may have associated inflammation either in the vitreous or you may have retinal vasculitis a little bit, or you may have uh, interior segment mild inflammation. This usually begins in the posterior pole as opposite to serpiginous choroditis, which is peripapillary to begin with. This has multifocality, and you will also see there is, you can see the pigmentation in the center. So these are some of the very classical pictures which will show you that what you are dealing with, though it looks like serpiginous, like choroditis, it could have TB as an etiology. So what I showed you so far are the very atypical phenotypes, but sometimes phenotype could be atypical, then how do you suspect? For example, and believe me, these are not very common. These are but you being a referral hospital and seeing patients which have not been able to being managed in the periphery. So sometimes it's important uh, that TB can mimic any form of the disease and we need to look for it. For example, this is a 50 year old patient and he presents with fibrinous uveitis first episode. So we do not have a classical chronic granulomatous form of disease. But he gives history of breathlessness and low grade fever. So when you have this kind of history, you need to look for what is going on. It could be sarcoid, but then again, we need to investigate. And when we do the uh, CT chest to look for, it shows the evidence for tuberculosis. He also has a PPD skin test of 12 into 12 mm. In fact, it's an open case of TB and his sputum also shows uh, the from the bronchioalveolar lavage, you can see there is this presence of AFP. The second example, which I'm going to show you is a young girl. The vision is 20, 100. She has received corticosteroids and she was being treated as fungal granuloma. So this is not a typical granuloma for TB because we are not seeing those uh, vessels unless you believe there is something going on here, but it's quite atypical for TB. However, when we investigated and we did the whole body PET scan, we found that there was omental deposits, there were cystic enlargement in the ovaries and looking at this, of course, our first thing was it could be metastasis in a young girl who's having a diffuse malignant disease all over the body. But when we investigated and our you know, gynecologist took the biopsy and ovarian and omental and everything, it actually showed the presence of uh, granulomatous, caseating granulomas and PCR positive for tuberculosis. So we treat the patient and you can see that not only you are able to treat the eye, you also take care of the rest of the body and you can see the ovaries, the uptake has reduced and the omentum, there is no uptake now. So this is just to show you how in a country like ours where TB is so rampant, it will not always follow the typical pictures that we have all read in the books, it may come in different forms. And this is one such example of a 57 year old woman 
She actually had trauma to the opposite eye in 2013 and now she comes with this kind of picture and there was some fluid in the peripatry area. So we do the OCT, we do see there is some thickening of the choroid and probably there is a peripapillary membrane there and uh, disc is hyper, opposite eye damage. So the first thing was it could be sympathetic ophthalmia. So treated as sympathetic ophthalmia and her disease is worsening. So if you see three months later, these spots have started appearing. There is increase in vitreitis, increase in the number of these grayish yellow lesions. And you can see even on fluorescein, this is done before and this is three months later, there is a definite worsening art progression of the disease. And at that time, we actually thought of a lot many things, including lymphomas and all, but when we repeated, we found Montius was positive, Quantiferon was positive, CT chest showed multiple calcified lesion in both the lobes and the small mediastinal lymph node. We even did whole body PET scan because the phenotype was so not suggestive of TB that we were confused. Whole body PET scan showed subcentimetric mediastinal lymph node, some uptake, some consolidatory changes which uh, they reported this is likely to be post granulometers change. And finally, I convinced her the enucleation of the opposite eye because we were honestly worried about lymphomas and all, but that is the blind eye, the traumatized eye. And what we find in the end is there is an AFB sitting in the opposite eye. So, it's a very atypical phenotype. It's a one-eyed patient, but we were treating her with steroids and immunosuppression, and that is why the disease was progressing. So she needs anti-TB therapy and response to it. You can see the disease responding, reduction in vitreitis, and media getting clearer. So comes the first question, when to suspect TB? If you are seeing typical phenotype that I showed, but when you are seeing atypical phenotype, when do you suspect TB? First, you have ruled out all other possible infections and whatever differentials you had, they have been ruled out. The second, you are treating it with corticosteroids and immunosuppression, but the disease is recurring. It means something is not right and it could be underlying TB. Many times you would be surprised the tests which were negative when you repeat them after one year, they do become positive. In country like ours, we do need to rule out tuberculosis because the disease can have protein manifestations. And this I already mentioned that be aware of the fact that many a times the test negative would become positive and that may be an important clue. So what are the challenges? The challenges are it's very difficult to establish the diagnosis because, uh, you know, there is no particular thing that we can biopsy and we can say, well, this is TB. We rely on indirect evidence, which includes PPD skin test, chest radiography, uh, biopsy of lymph nodes uh, from the mediastinal or parahylar area many a times quantiferon TB cold and PCR. But all of them actually determine exposure to tuberculosis. They don't tell you that this is definitely tuberculosis. So that is the major challenge is we do not have a definitive diagnosis and many of us who are not starting the TB treatment on their own and have to refer to our physician friends our physician friends actually send the patients back to us. They say, oh, this is not TB. They tell the patient, you don't need TB treatment. So there comes a major dilemma to the ophthalmologist. Besides the diagnosis, there are few other challenges. One, a big confusion all over the community. If it is TB, why give steroids? It should respond to TB. The second question, 
you start anti-TB drugs, the disease worsens because of the immune response called paradoxical worsening. So that is the time when you get confused that I started anti-TB drug and the disease is worsening. Probably that's not TB. And the third one, which is a very rare and not so common is drug resistant to anti-TB drugs. So let's go over them one by one. The first is corticosteroids. Should you give? Should you not give? So let's see how the disease occurs. There are two kinds of diseases which happen in the eye. One is the active mycobacterial infection, which means the mycobacteria are actually multiplying in the eye. So this is a hematogenous spread and uh, it means there is direct invasion of the mycobacteria into the local ocular tissues, such as choroidal granuloma. So if you see a huge choroidal granuloma, there is a chance that the bugs are actually multiplying and it could be infective form of the disease. But most of the other phenotypes represent an immunological response to the disease, which means vasculitis, granulomatous anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, are for that matter, serpiginous like choroiditis. What do these rep diseases represent? They represent that there is a mycobacterium which may be anywhere in the body. It could be in the eye. It could not be in the eye. But it's inciting a immune reaction. So there is an inflammatory response. So to take care of that inflammation, you need to treat it with steroids because the episode which has occurred now is because of inflammation. So you got to treat it with steroids. Then why give anti-TB drugs? That is because the mycobacterium is inciting the response. So if you give steroids, this episode will be resolved, but the disease has a tendency to come back because your etiologic agent is there. So to take care of recurrences over a long-term follow-up, you need to give ADT. Now, just to show you the example, this is an example of the multi-bacillary disease where there is a huge granuloma and where you suspect that this is the actively multiplying bacteria. Now, this is not the kind of the patient you would like to push in steroids. And you can see here, the patient has received a ozodex implant. And this is what his vitreous shows, teeming with bacteria. On the other hand, the immunological form of the disease, serpiginous like choroiditis. So what happens? This is the disease which is basically immune mediated and needs to be treated with steroids. ATT will take care of long-term recurrence. If we do not understand and we just try to push ATT here, right here without any steroids, what happens? Within two to three weeks, you will see paradoxical worsening with the new lesions appearing and the old lesions progressing. And this paradoxical worsening can be taken care of by adequate corticosteroids. If we have given to begin with, the paradoxical worsening would not occur. But if it occurs, then we need to increase corticosteroids or even intravitreal injection of methotrexate or ozodex in this kind of phenotype may be given. What causes paradoxical worsening? This we found that once you give anti-TB drugs, there are certain uh, inflammatory mediators which go up in the body and in the eye, which can cause it. So this, I already said that if you have a paradoxical worsening, intravitreal methotrexate, dextra, uh, dexamethasone implant are even increasing the dose of corticosteroid systemic itself would work. This is something which we are working right now. We recently published in American Journal and we are working on the artificial intelligence model as to how would you predict that which are the patients that are going to show paradoxical worsening. 
So if you see a yellow edge, which is really yellow and really big, and we have graded it into different kind of grades, but in simpler word, if you have this huge yellow thing and a plaque, these are the kind of the patients who are going to worsen. So be sure you are giving them good amount of steroids, one to 1.5 milligram per kg per day, along with the introduction of anti-TB drugs. The other challenge which I mentioned and I said is not so common is drug resistance. This is one such example of drug resistant TB. These are the patients who just do not respond and keep on worsening. And this patient was actually planned for enucleation of I in Delhi. And she came for second opinion. And when we did her vitrectomy, we found she uh, had a resistant repo B gene sequencing, which showed there was resistance. And we gave her MDR ATT. And you can see the I later. So TB is confusing and this was uh, how I began. Um, why is TB confusing? Because we don't speak the common language. So since we all are confused amongst ourselves, we end up confusing the physicians too. Because we just send it to them saying that uh, refer the patient to pulmonologist for starting ATT. So physician sees, he looks at the lung, he says, there's no TB, you do not need treatment. So that is what is happening because there is lack of common, uh, common language. So with this purpose that we all over the world are on same platform, we started this multicentric international study called COTS, Collaborative Ocular TB Study. So the study had three phases. We have completed the first two. The first phase was we just collected data from all over the world. There are 26 centers from 18 countries. So people just entered what they were doing. Just to realize that, you know, how are we managing our TB patients? The second was to have a consensus statements on TB so that we say, well, the physician or the uveitis experts have the consensus and these are documented so that anybody who wants to start the patient and convince the physician has these consensus statements to know when to start. And third one is prospective trial, which we are working on. So this is how we started long time ago. And this is the phase one, that is the collection of the real world data. I'm just going to highlight three, four important points. One very important point is when you have ocular disease, more than 90% of the patient are not going to show any evidence of active systemic disease. So don't try to look at the X-ray chest, RF, CT scan, looking for the cavitary lesion, because that will be seen only in 10% of the patients. And those patients would generally show those small tubercles in the eye or the huge tuberculoma. So this is a very important lesson that we learned. Choroditis was the most common form of posterior uveitis. Unlike what we have been told that TB is a chronic disease, when it begins in the eye, nearly 50% might have acute onset. Then chest X-ray was not as good as CT chest because CT could detect old exposure. And here I would like to say, when you have serpiginous like choroditis or vasculitis in the eye, you are not looking for active disease. What you are looking for is exposure to TB in the past are a latent disease. And to look for that, CT scan was much better than chest X-ray. Montius is still the most commonly performed test, which was positive in 87% of the patient and TB gold in 89%. PCR was not commonly performed or even trusted. So, because these are very in-house PCRs, we don't have any standardized PCR. 
So you don't have to feel guilty that you do not have PCR, so you cannot diagnose because all the experts uh, honestly do not value PCR for TB that much. There were regional variations and all. Uh, important was that serpiginous like choroditis has a very good outcome if you give anti-TB treatment. And the failure of the treatment was noted only in 13% of the patient, which means if you diagnose TB, if you treat it with anti-TB drugs, 88% chances that you will be successful, which is a very impressive figure. So uh, I would skip this. This is just the standardization of nomenclature for ocular TB, which we have done. And this is for the purpose of reporting so that we are all talking the same language. So my last couple of slides, will I will talk about COTS consensus. So we know the phenotype. We know how to diagnose TB. Now comes the next question that when will you start giving anti-TB drugs? As I mentioned, we uh, are confused, rather we were confused, so we got the experts together. So this is COTS that we started. Uh, there were three people, me, uh, then I took Rupesh Agarwal from Singapore and Moorfields Carlos Pavesio. So we started this group COTS and we were blessed that most of the major societies in uveitis, IUSG, IOIS, and then Foster, supported us and together we could come out with this. How was it done? I will briefly give you an introduction. We took into consideration what was the phenotype present, which area the patient came from, was it a first episode, a recurrent episode, was the disease active or inactive, then PPD, IGRA and chest imaging, different permutations and combinations. So we posed experts the question that what if the patient has anterior uveitis, first episode, only Montius positive, would you treat? So, you know, these were around uh, 486 questions, which took about three hours for each expert to answer. So they answered some of the question. The answers were not yes and no. Answers was how much was the probability to start anti-TB drugs? So without complicating further, we had two stages, Delphi 1 and Delphi 2, which is just the, you know, it's just the methodology, but I will come to the practical aspects. What do the experts agree on? The first thing which all the experts agreed was Serpiginous like choroditis is a very important phenotype. That is, it is so characteristic phenotype that when you see serpiginous like choroditis, you think of tuberculosis. So if the patient has serpiginous like choroditis, he could be from any area, endemic, non-endemic, and he has both the immunological test positive, that is PPD and IGRA, and one radiology that is CT are chest positive, there was more than 90% consensus that we should give anti-TB drugs. Same, patient has serpiginous choroditis from any region, both the immunological test positive, that is PPD and IGRA positive and chest imaging either not done, not available. Experts agreed that this patient should be treated. Third, the patient is serpiginous like choroditis, any region, either PPD or IGRA positive and radiology positive showing evidence of old healed exposure. There was consensus to treat. Some of the uh, points were controversial, which were discussed in Delphi 2. So these are not strong consensus, these are moderate consensus, which means that if you have serpiginous like choroditis, patient could be from any region. Even if one of the tests is positive, which means serpiginous like choroditis, even if only Montius is positive, 
there was consensus to treat, a moderate consensus to treat. The only difference was that if the patient is from endemic region, they relied more on Montu skin test, but if the patient was from non-endemic region, they relied on EGRA. But the moral of the story is, if you have serpiginous like keratitis and even one test positive, you have a moderate consensus to treat. There was a uniform consensus that you to prevent the paradoxical worsening after starting ATT, systemic corticosteroids must be initiated. And in patients, if you are not able to wean off the corticosteroid or where the disease progresses despite ATT, you may add corticosteroid sparing immunosuppressants. There was no consensus on intravitreal injection of steroids and methotrexate, and it was said that it is the individual's choice. Uh, I will not go into too much details or further, but uh, because these are all published in journal of ophthalmology, in ophthalmology journal, uh, both the reports one and two. The second group was uh, about phenotypes other than uh, serpiginous choroditis, and I will just give you the highlights. For anterior uveitis, there was no strong consensus, honestly, to treat even if all the three tests were positive. It was just a moderate consensus. And majority of the experts felt the absolute consensus was that only if the attacks are recurring, which means you see anterior uveitis, there is no need to rush on the first episode to add anti-TB drugs. It's only if the attack is coming back you may have to give. Similarly, if you have pan uveitis and all the three test positive, there was a very strong consensus to treat. For intermediate uveitis, the consensus was moderate because the problem is intermediate uveitis is not something very typical. However, the experts said that if you see the intermediate uveitis, which is not responding to your usual therapy of steroids and all, and is recurrent, NTTB may be given. For retinal vasculitis, if it is active retinal vasculitis and you had all the three positive, there, and the patient was from endemic region, there is a strong consensus to treat. However, it's important to know that many times you do vitrectomy for vitreous hemorrhage and you find the healed vasculitis, there is no need to treat healed vasculitis with anti-TB drugs. So this is what the consensus group, which we held in 2018, and both the papers are in ophthalmology. And any one of you wanting more details on it could contact me personally, and I would be very happy to share it with you all. So Dr. Sandeep told me to talk for 40 minutes, so I'm well in time and thank you very much once again. It's been total privilege and honor to be presenting in front of Dr. Sandeep Saxena and all of you. Thank you.